All right, so uh, we're I guess we're recording now. Getting started here on the fifth video now in the series um, on Dewey's art as experience. Probably gonna record at least two or three more videos today and post them up on YouTube. This video, we still got a couple more slides to cover that are a part of chapter, uh, I've been calling it chapter two, but it's actually chapter three. Forget that there's a short excerpt. Um, there's a second chapter called The Live Preacher and, it, the, and Ethereal Things. And we actually did cover it <laughs> the last video. A few, there's some of that material where he's talking about how art, um, art is derived from our experience of cause and effect in nature, you know, gets, you know, transformed by us into the notion of means and, and consequences. Um, and this is sort of the germ of art. This is the, the seed of art in, in nature and, and, and in human experience. And, you know, there's some other uh, t uh, things we covered last time about, um, you know, the, the distinction between human experience and animal experience and, and also the parallels as well. So this video, again, we got a couple more slides to do that are kind of wrapping up what I was calling chapter two is actually chapter three. Uh, the title of the chapter is having an experience. Uh, so Dewey's going to get, you know, kind of, he, he winnows in more specifically on what he means by experience proper. Um, and so you should really review the last video if you haven't gone over that yet, because these next few slides, he makes an interesting point uh, related, but it's not, I guess, the focal point of the chapter. He'll return to this in the next chapter, which we're going to really be uh, covering primarily in this video. It's chapter four. Uh, the title of that chapter is the act of expression. So, you know, we've talked about the live creature uh, you know, and its environment, uh, experience in general, how certain experiences differ than others. Some are aesthetic, some are anesthetic, some are non-aesthetic or unesthetic. And uh, so again, in this video, we're going to kind of focus on experience and um, the act of expression really primarily. And I think it's going to take us probably this video and part of the next one to get through uh, that chapter four. Right? And then we're going to move on to uh, some other things, right? We're going to you know, dive into some of the other later chapters, not quite as in depth as we have been these early chapters because they're so key. But let's go ahead and start up here. Let's look at this quote. Um, where Dewey's making a pretty bold uh, declaration. He's not the only philosopher to make these sort of claims about literature and art and its superiority over the social sciences in certain regards, right? When it comes to understanding human experience, especially as, as Dewey um, uh, refers to here, new experience, you know, when, when, we're, when we're trying to explain to somebody something that's completely new, um, as he puts it, an interplay may take place in which a new experience develops, right? Social um, relations develop between groups that, that weren't there before, you know, et cetera, et cetera. We, we know all these historical conditions. I have, you know, pictures here of um, Dostoevsky's, you know, cover to Dostoevsky novels, uh, particularly the de demons, or sometimes it's, um, it's translated as the possessed. It, I guess is a good example of what I'm talking about. Right? You've got this sort of social... Um, a political situation uh, in which all these 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 young men in in, in Russia in in uh, you know pre Bolshevik Russia right before the revolution uh, they have like really no future it's a sort of desolate climate uh, and it was kind of a unique sort of you know it was after the emancipation of the serfs but before before the Bolshevik revolution so before before the overthrow of the monarchy uh, and it was a turbulent time. And so, you know, I think for Dewey, he's going to say reading a Dostoevsky novel will get you a better sense of what it might have been like to be a young Russian man during this time, during this pre-revolutionary period, and uh, much more so than reading a, a, a book of uh, social science that had statistics and facts and figures about the same, uh, you know, I guess the same uh, social constellation. So Dewey writes, you know, again, an experience, sorry, an interplay may take place in which a new experience develops. Where should we look for an account of such an experience? Not to ledger entries, nor yet to a treatise on economics or sociology or personnel psychology, but to drama or fiction. Its nature and import can be expressed only by art because there is a unity of experience that can be expressed only as an experience. 
The experience is of material fraught with suspense and moving towards its own consummation through a connected series of varied incidents, right? So, so to understand pre-Bolshevik Russia, you know, from the standpoint of like a young Russian youth who sees this sort of bleak outlook on life and no future, et cetera, um, to really understand that, again, the Dostoevsky novel is the way to go. Now, Dewey gives us an example here uh, to try to, to, to make his point. And this is really where we end the chapter on um, having an experience. This is the end of chapter three, at least our examination of it. So this is a, lo a very long quote, <clears throat> but it's, he's trying to do the same thing, right? He's trying to be, I guess, a, 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 a literati, right? He's trying to be a writer himself of fiction to give us a sense of how a certain situation can only be really conveyed properly through through literature, through art, not through um, just factual description <clears throat> that you might find in a, a statistician's book, right? So in this case, he's talking about somebody going to apply for a job. And for him, emotion is a unifying factor. We've talked about this in previous videos. It's going to come back. We're going to talk a lot about emotions once we get into this next chapter where he talks about expression, right? Because obviously there's going to be um, – a relationship between artistic expression and emotion, uh, at least for Dewey there is, okay? So, but again, this, this example here is, is, he's trying to illustrate how certain situations that are wrought with emotion and anxiety and tension can only be really expressed or understood by other people through art, through this sort of description, right? So here we go, here's his example again, of the, the job applicant. So Dewey writes, the primary emotions on the part of the applicant may be at the beginning, hope or despair, and elation or disappointment at the close. These emotions qualify the experience as a unity, right? Again, we've talked about this in previous videos. For, for Dewey, much like in Heidegger, um, you know, emotion colors our whole experience, our whole you know, sense of presence of things in the world. That's more the way that Heidegger would put it. Uh, but again, the experience, it's not something that is, is absolutely private. It involves this relation with our environment, right? It's a response and a coming together between a self and an environment, and it permeates our experience. Okay, so so emotion is key. And how do you and how do you um, exp how do you explain that? How do you make that clear to someone else who is not having those emotions? Only through art and literature, right? So again, these emotions qualify the experience as a unity. But as the interview proceeds, secondary emotions are evolved as variations of the primary underlying one. It is even possible for each attitude and gesture, each sentence, almost every word, to produce more than a fluctuation in the intensity of a basic emotion. To produce, that is, a change of shade and tint in its quality. The employer sees by means of his own emotional reactions the character of the one applying. He projects him imaginatively into the work to be done and judges by his fitness, by the way in which the elements of the scene assemble and either dash or fit together, right? So the applicant comes in there, the employer is looking at him, he's trying to read him, not just his his actual factual statements that he's making as answers to the job interview questions, but you know, how agitated the guy gets, how fidgety he is, right? How nervous he looks, um, how tense everything is. Okay. And so, and this is going to be a sort of uh, a constantly shifting, you know, who knows, maybe a cat and mouse game, depending on uh, the character of the interviewer and the interviewee, um, the presence and behavior of the applicant, either harmonize with his own attitudes and desires, right? So the, the employer, you know, he kind of looks at the applicant and he says, okay, this does seem like the kind of guy fit for this kind of work. I can imagine him doing this. Or they don't, right? Or they conflict and jar. Such factors as these inherently aesthetic in quality are the forces that carry the varied elements of the interview to a decisive issue, right? They, they, they're, they're, they're really, Dewey's kind of arguing here in this I'm kind of with them on this. People t tend to, um, they tend to get confused. Why are you so interested in art? Why are you so interested in aesthetics? But for me, I think aesthetics is so important <laughs> and, 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 and the way things are presented aesthetically have such a hold on us emotionally and our decisions and, and, and how we react and, and, and what we'll accept politically or ethically or whatever. So 
for better or worse, I think aesthetics are important, right? So again, all these elements, all these emotional cues and readings and this sort of uh, the sense of the scene that is established between the interviewer, the interviewee, uh, all of this is what brings the interview to a decisive issue. They enter into the settlement of every situation, whatever its dominant nature, in which there are uncertainty and suspense. So that was, the, that was sort of wrapping up. Um, that last chapter, right? We, we, we did most of it in the last video, right? So we were focusing really there on, on, on this notion of experience in general and what, what Dewey sort of means, what's so special about having an experience, right? How, how, how that an experience is different from just experience in general, right? An aesthetic experience, an intense, complete, unified experience that's the completion uh, of some moment or period of distress or strife uh, and overcoming. And I didn't even mean to do that. That's a pretty good segue, though, into this next chapter. You know, for him, expression, when we talk about artistic expression, <clears throat> and that's, that's what this uh, chapter is focusing on, right? The title of the chapter is The Act of Expression. Uh, for him, it's always going to evolve that sort of tension. There's always going to be, uh, for one, incorporation and development, right? So we're going to overcome something in the environment, and through that overcoming, we become... Um, more more um, ex expansive in our outlook, more expansive in our possibilities, right? So, so you know, I was using the example in a previous video, the, you know, the caveman and the fire, right? The fire, when, when, the, when the lightning bolt struck down and caused fire, it was, it was something that was, you know, uh, deadly, right? And the, you know, er, early, early humans had to run from it, right? And, but eventually that, you know, human was under, able to understand the relation of cause and effect and able to harness what was once what was once an obstacle was able to harness it so he overcame it and with fire became a new more complicated more complex organism right who was able to create tools and work with metal etc okay so for for dewey this tension is something that's going to be inherent in any act of expression but not just the tension it always is going to involve a sort of incorporation of previous um overcomings right previous struggles that have been overcome okay so let's jump right in to this, this chapter four uh, and see what I've got for us here. We got this uh, first quote, Nietzsche writes, or sorry, Dewey writes, it is this double change, and we'll get to what he means, what is the double change he's referring to that, that comes later. It is this double change which converts an activity into an act of expression. Things in the environment that would otherwise be mere smooth channels or else blind obstructions become means media right just like fire it used to be something that was ominous threatening once humans were able to control it it becomes something that is able to be harnessed a means a media <clears throat> at the same time things retained from past experience that would grow stale from routine or inert from lack of use become coefficients in new adventures and put on a raiment of fresh meaning. Here are all the elements needed to define expression, right? So for him, you've got this double change, right? There's two things. One, right, is things that were once obstructive become channels for expression, right? For this, you know, for, um, they, they would, sorry, the things that were smooth channels become uh, obstructions and have to be used as means or media. And at the same time, um, things from past experience are used in a new light, right? In order to do what? They become coefficients in new adventures and put on a raiment of fresh meaning. This is all very vague and abstract at this point, uh, but then he gives us a few examples later on, which I think will kind of make it a little bit more clear what he's talking about, right? I mean, clearly he's talking about first this struggle, this tension, this overcoming of it <clears throat> through some medium, you know, through some sort of, in this case, we're talking about art, so an artistic medium. And at the same time, there's something from our past, right, that is retained and becomes used in this new, uh, this new experience, expression, um, artistic product, I think is the word that he would, might technically want us to use. I was about to say artwork. Um, but, you know, you'll see in a later video, he's not too happy with that, right? He thinks that artwork should be distinguished from art product. Um, so anyway, for him, if we want to talk about expression, most of us, we might use that term 
in a sense that's much more broad in general than Dewey would allow, <laughs> right? So again, it, it's always going to involve not just a, a tension with the environment, right? That would otherwise be smooth, right? Sort of something that comes along an obstacle and this becomes something to overcome, comes media or medium, right? We, we, we have something we want to express perhaps. We, we, have, we have an impulse to do something, we can't. And so it's channeled elsewhere through some media or medium. And so at the same time, also, we're using something from our past, right? You know, it could be from our own personal past, our own, you know, if you're talking about your own sort of autobiography, or, you know, Dewey's probably thinking in more general terms, our animal past, right? Our human past, the ability to use tools that it has been a part of our culture, you know, since our, our own inception, right? So before I was born, painting existed, but I might have something that I want to do and I can't really do it directly. And so I have to express it through paint if that makes any sense. I don't know. Again, he's going to give us a few examples here that I think might, might make it a little bit more clear. But um, he's going to start off by really getting into his beef with, you know, this notion of expressionist in any time that we, we um, any time that we are emotional as human beings, that is seen as an act of expression. But Dewey prefers, like in the last chapter, you know, he prefers to look at experience in two ways you can think of it more generally in in a certain sense we're always having experience if you think of it a more broad general sense but for dewey there's also this more specific sense and experience has a unity to it it has a consummation there are steps that lead up to an end point and then there's a, there's a sort of resting and equilibrium and then of course we move on and there's always further strife but but of course there's always that completion for him and Likewise, when he's talking about expression, not any time I get angry and yell at somebody is that really expression for Dewey, technically. So he writes, not all outgoing activity is of the nature of expression. At one extreme, there are storms of passion that break through barriers and that sweep away whatever intervenes between a person and something he would destroy. There is activity but not from the standpoint of the one acting expression. An onlooker may say, what a magnificent expression of rage. But the enraged being is only raging, quite a different matter from expressing rage. Generalization of such instances will protect us from the error, which has unfortunately invaded aesthetic theory of supposing that the mere giving way to impulsion native or habitual constitutes expression such an act is expressive not in itself but only in reflective inter sorry in, sorry only in reflective interpretation on the part of some observer as the nurse may interpret a sneeze as the sign of an impending cold as far as the act itself is concerned it is if purely impulsive just a boiling over this is interesting too. I think I, I find parallels here between Dewey and Heidegger here. Uh, just like they, they don't see emotions as something separate or out there in the world. They're kind of communal. That's a, a parallel between Heidegger and Dewey. Another parallel, I, I think right here, um, somebody yelling and screaming uh, and throwing a temper tantrum is not expression, Dewey would say, right? It can be, if somebody can interpret it as such, right? It's gonna take an observer, like again, the nurse will interpret it. You know, look, he's expressing anger. He's expressing rage, right? But without that, uh, as, she, as he puts it, reflective interpretation, without that, there, there, there is no rage. There is no boiling over uh, understood as such, okay? Uh, this might not make quite much sense, right? But let's get to his get to this next quote. Maybe you'll 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 buy his argument a little bit more uh, when you get to a fuller picture of his theory. Let's see. So for him, when we're talking about expression, and and he's got an etymological argument we're going to get to in the next couple of slides, right? So if you're just if you're not convinced, if you're like, wait a minute, come on, like. Where's he coming from? I, I get it. When you're talking about artistic expression, usually there's a media, or sorry, a medium involved. So the the you know the painter is going to have an emotion, right? But instead of screaming, he'll write it, he'll have an angry painting. Instead of, you know, um, 
I, I, expressing his love in a lo in a romantic gesture to the person he loves, he'll write a song or something like this, um, or paint a picture of the person. Um, and so you might say, okay, well, yeah, sure, those are expressive, and that's one case. Why does he think this is special? Uh, and and that's the proper way to think of expression. Uh, and when we use the term expression, like this guy over there is being angry and he's expressing rage. Um, you know, why are we wrong and Dewey's right? Well, he goes to the etymology of it, right? The, the word origin, where did it come from? But he also, I think he's also talking about our experience of expression. Um, while there is no expression unless there's urge from within outwards, the welling up must be clarified and ordered by taking it into itself the values of prior experiences before it can be an active expression. And these values are not called into play save through objects of the environment that offer resistance to the direct discharge of emotion and impulse. Emotional dis discharge is a necessary but not a sufficient condition of expression, right? So in other words, of course, emotion has to be there. The artist has an underlying emotion, obviously. You know, they, they have something that they want to express, right? but that's not enough to call it an act of expression, right? If you scream and yell, that's an impulse. A baby can do that, right? You're going to call a baby an artist? What is the baby? Ex you know, the baby might be expressing anger, uh, uh, hunger, um, diaper being dirtiness, whatever, you know, whatever the baby's trying to, ex to express, but it's not aware of this, right? And it's, it's, it's a reaction. It's just, it doesn't even know why it's doing it, okay? You know, for, do for Dewey, there has to be this conscious intent, right? Um, again, uh, values of prior experiences have to be in play, right? And so we can't really say that of the baby until it develops the, the, the notion of what the effectiveness of its actions are going to be. And I, I guess I should hold off a bit because, you know, Dewey uses that same example of the baby. So I better, better let him do that. I better give that to him. Um, but again, this is sort of more on his point. There's no expression without excitement, right? So, so again, emotions obviously are tied to expression. They're not the same thing. So there's no expression without excitement, without turmoil. Yet an inner agitation that is discharged at once in a laugh or cry passes away with its utterance. To discharge is to get rid of, to dismiss. To express is to stay by, to carry forward in development, to work out to completion. So it's a process, right? It's not something like this, you know, this, this, the boss uh, is yelling at her employee here, you know, she's angry, he's, you know, being lazy or, you know, maybe he's, you know, surfing the internet when he's supposed to be doing his work. And, you know, for, for, for Dewey, this is not properly expression. You know, this is a, you know, if you want to be technical, it's more she's exposing her character, right? Her, her, her short temper or whatever, or her animosity to this guy who, for being lazy or whatever, right? So for, for, for Dewey, once, she ex once, once that, that cry or that yell is, is out, it's over. It's discharged, right? Whereas the artistic expression, or when I express something otherwise, I stay with it, as he puts it, right? I leave something there. I want to sort of maintain this. Hey, here's this, here's this, this emotion I had, and there's that, that initial impulse to want to scream or cry or laugh or whatever and it's held back and channeled through through other media so what is sometimes called an act of self-expression might be better termed one of self-exposure it discloses character or lack of character to others in itself it is only a spewing forth the transition from an act that is expressive from the standpoint of an outside observer to one that is intrinsically expressive, like properly expressive in the, in the way Dewey thinks we should understand the term expression, right, um, is readily illustrated by a simple case. And again, now he's going to get into the baby, okay? At first, a baby weeps just as it turns its head to follow the light. There is an inner urge, but nothing to express. As the infant matures, he learns that particular acts affect different consequences. That, for example, he gets attention if he cries, and that smiling induces another definite response from those about him. He thus begins to be aware of the meaning of what he does. As he grasps the meaning of an act at first performed from sheer internal pressure, he becomes capable of acts of true expression. The transformation of sounds, babblings, lolling, and so forth into language is a perfect illustration of the way in which acts of expression are brought into existence and also the difference between them 
and mere acts of discharge, right? So mere acts of discharge, there's not this preceding conscious intent. There's not this awareness of the meaning of my actions, right? I'm going to yell at somebody and they might, they might not take it the way that I want them to. I'm, you know, I, I might be, I might take it too far and they might think, geez, this guy hates my guts when I'm just, I'm just frustrated, right? Uh, but the, the active expression takes into account the effect of my active expression, right? Much like the baby, once they start to understand what it means to point, to cry, and the kind of reactions they get out of it, that for, for Dewey is expression proper. So he says, there is a suggested, if not exactly exemplified, in such cases, the connection of expression with art. The child who has learned the effect of his once spontaneous act has upon those around him, per, sorry, has upon those around him, performs on purpose an act that was blind. So once he understands, you know, the effects of his pointing on the people around him, he's going to start actually doing things on purpose, and there's intention. He begins to manage and order his activities in reference to their consequences. There is now art in its incipiency. An activity that was natural, spontaneous, and unintended is transformed because it is undertaken as a means to a consciously entertained consequence. Such, such transformation marks every deed of art, right? So again, there's, there's this inner impulse, there's an inner intention, there's obviously an emotion, but it is channeled through some means, a pointing, a smiling, right? A, a, a work of art. <clears throat> that is expression proper for Dewey. So what does this have to do with authenticity? Uh, this is sort of um, something that, that Dewey doesn't dwell on for very long, but he mentions it here, right? Sometimes our expression is inauthentic, right? Is it really a, an expression? I don't know. I'm not quite remembering here. I just read this quote a, a while ago, but let's read it now and see what he has to say about insincerity or inauthentic, you know, being inauthentic. So wherever there's a split between what is done and its purpose exists, there is insincerity, a trick, a simulation of an act that intrinsically has another effect. When the natural and the cultivated blend in one, acts of social intercourse are works of art. So when we're sincere and authentic and our internal, our intentions are brought to the fore through acts of expression, a smile, a gesture, in a, you know, he's saying that those are works of art. This is where I think a lot of people will want to criticize Dewey as being a little too broad with his definition of art. You know, if, if art is experience and things like having good social intercourse, as he puts it here, uh, nice and authentic, right? Your intentions coalesce with your actions and your expression and everybody else is sort of along with it. And there's this camaraderie. If that's art, I mean, it seems like that that opens the floodgate for all sorts of other things to be considered art. Uh, but anyways, I digress. Let's continue with this uh, quote. Right. So anyway, the, when the natural and the cultivated blend in one, <clears throat> acts of social intercourse are works of art. The animating impulsion of genial friendship and the deed performed completely coincide without intrusion of ulterior purpose. Awkwardness may prevent adequacy of expression, but the skillful, but the skillful, the skillful counterfeit, however skilled, goes through the form of expression. It does not have the form of friendship and abide in it. <clears throat> All right, so here's, I guess, why <clears throat> this is relevant here is that in a certain sense, um, deviance and delusion, <laughs> or no, it's not delusion, Devi deviant, um, he uses the word counterfeit quite a bit. I'm trying to think, what's the word I'm, I'm trying to, it's with my tongue. Um, you know, being a con artist, right? Putting on a fake front, right? Like this apple here on the right. Um, there's something about that that's, that is expression, right? This guy, he's not happy, but he wants to project happiness to the world, okay? It's an inauthentic expression, but he's using media. He's using signals. He knows that the smile uh, symbolizes happiness. And so even though he's not happy, uh, this is sort of how he, uh, you know, deals and copes with the situation. You know, maybe this is his boss asking him, you know, if he's having a nice day and he doesn't want to come off all gloomy and he, like, he doesn't like his job. So oh, I'm great boss and just gets back to work. Right. Um, 
So the act that expresses uses the smile, the outreached hand, the lighting up of the face as media. Um, not consciously, but because they have become organic means of communicating delight upon meeting a valued friend. Acts that were primitively spontaneous are converted into means that make human intercourse more rich and gracious. Just as a painter converts pigment into means of expressing an imaginative experience, right? The painter has this imagined, uh, this, this experience in their mind, and has this beautiful painting in mind, and brings it to the fore through the pigment, through, through, through the, the oil or the, the, the acrylic or whatever medium they're using. Dance and sport are activities in which acts that were once performed spontaneously in separation are assembled and converted from raw, crude material into works of expressive art. Only where material is employed as media is there expression in art, right? So for him, this is a, this is a necessary condition of artistic expression. There's always some media involved, right? Some sort of, you know, whether it's dance or, or paint or sculpture or through music, through instruments, there's always a go-between. So the connection between a medium and the act of expression is intrinsic. An act of expression always employs natural material. Though it may be natural in the sense of habitual, right, like a dance move, you know, we just sort of, we, we stride a certain way, as well as that as primitive or native. Um, this is interesting. He starts to get to the etymology of expression. He starts to use this um, analogy of the wine press. But I think I, I want to keep these videos shorter. They've been really long. I meant to cover a little bit more in this video. But we're already at 30 minutes, and I kind of like the 30-minute uh, stopping point. So I'm going to stop it here, and we'll pick up right here at this quote. And I think this is really where he kind of gets into the more technicalities of an expression and such and so forth and how it applies to art per se, more specifically to works of art. Uh, and so again, we'll save that for the next video and we should probably be able to finish this chapter in that video. We don't have a whole lot left and we might even have time to get into the next chapter, right? Uh, where he talks about um, not shape and form. What is the next chapter uh, we're getting into? Uh, he talks about, oh, he talks more about media specifically, all of uh, the uh, different types of media and how they affect art in general, right? So we have that to look forward to uh, in the next video. Thanks for sticking around to the end of this one. And um, hopefully I will get to uh, see you guys on the, uh, on the other side.